It's been a long time since I've gotten as many requests to cover a single anime as I have for Made in Abyss. Ever since the series finished airing, not a day's gone by without someone asking me to cover it on what's in an OP, or what's in a scene, or talk about why we all love it so dang much, apparently. And having finally gotten around to actually finishing the show, don't blame me, it was a busy summer, I can totally see why to an extent. Unfortunately, while both the OP and ED are really good, there's not a lot of meat on them to analyze. And beyond that, I'm not convinced that Made in Abyss is quite the anime of the year material that it's been hyped up to be. Game of the year, maybe, but we'll get to that. Its world is rendered in almost unparalleled detail, which I love as a lore geek, and the music, animation, and direction are all totally on point, but it's not quite a masterpiece. The anime adaptation rushes through a lot of manga chapters that aren't plot essential but do build the world in order to get to the good stuff farther in. And while the note that it ends on is emotionally satisfying, it feels more like a midpoint break in the story than a proper conclusion. It leaves us with a lot of questions and very few answers. And aside from the fantastic balloon sequence in the final credits which was apparently come up with by the mangaka, the emotional payoff of the final episode isn't really tied to anything that's been built up in the rest of the series. The show is getting a second season, so that will eventually be a moot point, but what we have now feels very, if you want more, read the manga, and it's a shame to be left feeling that way, because the adaptation does a really good job of playing to the strengths of anime most of the time. So when you do get to a plot point that's obviously been glazed over, or reach the show's cliffhanger ending, it feels all the more jarring. At some points, it's just painfully clear that what you're watching isn't an original work, it's an adaptation. Although at first glance, you might not think that it's a manga adaptation. In fact, even when experiencing the original story in manga form, I'm still left with the distinct impression that I'm reading a secondary work. It has great art, strong panel flow, and good writing, but the plot structure and world design don't quite seem like they were crafted with a manga in mind. Rather, Maiden Abyss reads and watches more like a video game adaptation than anything else. I remarked on the Summer Weebcast that the show's world and characters seemed like building blocks for the coolest game ever. Its blend of elements from dungeon crawlers like Etrian Odyssey and action RPGs like Mega Man Legends and Eco speaks to me on a very deep and personal level. But this isn't just a matter of inspiration or aesthetics. The deeper I dive into the abyss, this, the more convinced I become that it was originally designed as a video game world by creator Akihito Tsukushi and later repurposed as a manga and eventually an anime. That definitely lines up with his career history. Before he became a mangaka, Tsukushi spent 10 years working as an artist at Konami, where he took a leading role on three video game projects, Dewey's Adventure and the two Elibits games. His cute, colorful art style is all over those video games, though not the darker storytelling sensibilities that we see on display in Made in Abyss. It's not at all unusual for people who work in the game industry to dream up and even create design documents for dream projects that they want to make one day. And as a lead artist, Sakushi would actually be in a good position to pitch something like that to his bosses. I wouldn't be surprised if that's exactly how Made in Abyss began its life. Of course, that's ultimately speculation on my part, but video game influences pervade almost every aspect of the show and books. Just look at the characters, specifically Reg. His entire design screams video game protagonist. His bulky tin can arms and legs are immediately reminiscent of Mega Man, and his horned helmet and tattered clothing bring to mind the titular protagonist of one of the most influential art games of all time, Eco, which also bears a bit of influence on the show's tone. Beyond those obvious points of reference, everything about him seems to be expressly designed to convey something about his abilities as a playable character. The bulky metal bits of armor give the impression that he's tougher than your regular human, with the soft flesh underneath speaking to his emotional vulnerability. His arms are built for exactly two purposes, shooting out to grab things and firing lasers, and even his helmet has a heads-up display, the purpose of which is revealed exactly one manga chapter after the anime ends. The second the second I saw him extend his arm to pull himself up in the anime, my mind immediately jumped to platforming gameplay. He just looks like a character who'd be fun to control. The same goes for Riko, especially when you put her next to him. Everything about her cave raider outfit says that she's resourceful, but a little weak. A character who spends her time solving puzzles, collecting inventory items to store in her many pouches and huge knapsack, and scavenging for supplies. Put the two of them together, and gameplay scenarios immediately begin to unfold 
unfold in your mind. Reg defending Rico from enemies while she lays traps, Rico collecting plants and other material to craft useful items for their journey, perilous platforming challenges with long drops and lots of rope swings. Lots of anime lend themselves pretty well to a video game adaptation, but rarely do they give you more than a vague notion of how they might play. FMA could be anything from a beat-em-up to an RPG, and in fact, it's been both. On the flip side, when you look at everything in Made in Abyss, a distinct impression of a specific gameplay style emerges in your mind pretty quickly. An action RPG with platforming and survival elements mixed in. A great gameplay match for selling the harsh nature of this world. Speaking of, the Abyss itself also seems to be taken straight out of a video game. It's even divided up into levels of increasing danger, with a whole bunch of lore specifically written to explain why the monsters get more formidable the further down you go. Moreover, each area of the Abyss seems to have been designed specifically around Rico and Reg's gameplay abilities. The first layer, the Edge of the Abyss, is your typical tutorial zone. Lots of minor collectibles to discover, relatively easy terrain to traverse, and not many enemies, though the lore allows for monsters from tougher areas to occasionally appear here. The terrain is a combination of gentle slopes and somewhat steep cliffs, which provide fertile ground for the player to figure out Reg's movement options. The second layer, the Forest of Temptation, provides a bit more of a challenge, with platforms suspended above instant death pits and wind currents blocking Reg's extendable arms at certain sections. The third layer changes things up by forcing players to descend carefully, making even more precise use of Reg's arms to swing between gaps in the wall. Meanwhile, Rico's tracking and survival skills are needed to navigate the maze of caves within the sheer cliff face. The fourth layer, the Goblet of Giants, consists of platforms that are close enough together for the kids to fairly easily jump between them and go to combat encounters on each one, but far enough apart that any attempt at ascent will trigger the Curse of the Abyss. As a game mechanic, I'd wager that the Curse of the Abyss would be a bit more forgiving than it is as a plot point, but still cost Rico a substantial amount of health every time she ascends. Going further down, the Sea of Corpses is a pretty obvious place to put a water level, as well as a sort of self-contained adventure involving Bondroud and Ido Front Fortress, and deeper than that, we delve into, well, spoiler territory. Although without going into specifics, the idea of a point of no return boundary before the last two levels will sound familiar to almost anyone who's ever played a video game before. Even the creatures of the Abyss are designed with specific gameplay purposes in mind. A lot of them are enemies, obviously, from low-level threats like hammer beaks and crying corpses, all the way up to full-on bosses like the Orbed Piercer. Then there are things like the Shroom Bears that seem to have been explicitly designed to carry healing items in the form of water shrooms. And do I even have to go into detail about the relics, special items with powerful abilities that aid in navigating the abyss? The very concept is lifted straight from a video game. A lot has been said about the world building in Maiden Abyss, which is commendably strong. Everything from the society built around the abyss to tiny details about the ecology of Uncle Lovecraft's Funtime Murder Hole is described in great detail, even when it has little bearing on the plot. But if you pull back, you do see a bit of a common thread between those details. While trivia, like the fact that hammerbeak feathers are flammable and their skulls and beaks contain everything necessary to prepare their meat, is interesting and extraneous in the context of a manga, it's kind of essential information in a video game where they're a primary source of food. And that's true of almost everything that Maiden Abyss bothers to explain in any depth. Detail is lavished upon areas that players might explore, such as the town of Orth and layers of the Abyss, as well as the creatures that they might interact with and items they might use. The world beyond the borders of the island, meanwhile, remains largely shrouded in mystery. This isn't a knock against the show or manga. Regardless of where it originally came from, all this extraneous detail does make the show's world feel more real and alive than it otherwise would. I love the world of Maiden Abyss, I just feel like I might love it a bit more if I was able to explore it for myself. But maybe the biggest clue to the origin of Maiden Abyss as a video game design document is its plot structure, which is, well, basically identical to how a plot is laid out in your average JRPG. It starts with a tutorial mission and a scripted action sequence with a boss monster, an introduction first to Rico's job as a cave raider and then to the mysterious reg. Then we get either a side mission or a cutscene as they sneak into the orphanage and experiment experiment on Reg. From this point, the story moves pretty quickly until Reg goes on his first mission, a tutorial for players to learn his abilities. Immediately 
After this, there's another cutscene where they say their goodbyes, and then the kid's actual descent into the abyss begins. The first proper level takes place in the same environment as the tutorial, but takes them deeper down and involves a time limit with the group leader chasing after them. It ends with a cutscene when they meet Uncle Habbo, then gameplay resumes as they have to traverse the second layer to reach the Seeker camp, fighting enemies along the way. The camp acts as a quest hub of sorts, as well as the location of the first real boss battle against Ozen, complete with her own boss arena. Following this, we get more cutscene dialogue, followed by a survival mission where the kids have to spend 10 days out in the forest. The weird armored hippo thing serves as a mini-boss in this level. After this, we get a farewell cutscene with the characters we've just met, then Rico and Reg enter the next level. After a platforming segment using Reg's extending arms along the cliff face, he ends up incapacitated by a fight with a mini-boss, and the real area boss, the Crimson Splitjaw, shows up shortly after that. Rico gets a solo level where she has to use her survival and puzzle skills to get away and find food without Reg's help for a little while. Reg regains consciousness just in time for a proper boss fight with the split jaw, then they make it to the fourth layer. After a bit more platforming, they find themselves in a mandatory loss boss fight against the orbed piercer, and now it's Rico's turn to be incapacitated while Reg meets Nanachi. Nanachi's house acts as the next quest hub area from which she sends Reg out on solo platforming and combat missions to collect supplies. Exploration of the fourth area culminates in a final boss fight against the Orb Weaver, then we get another cutscene to cap off the story of that area and move on to the fifth area, at which point the anime ends. Although it's pretty clear that the white whistle Bondraud is being set up as the next big boss fight. And after that, I think we can safely assume that there will be another hub area on the sixth layer and a whole new story that will play out there before the final level. This plot structure is designed to ensure a good balance of action and narrative development while creating natural breaks where additional missions and levels can easily be inserted without harming the flow of the overall story. Each level is made to have its own mini narrative that can be fleshed out as much as needed to support this extra gameplay. This is perfect for a video game, but it has some flaws when translated to other media. Giving each area its own self-contained story, even if you tie it into an overarching narrative, inherently means that the climax of each act of your plot is going to be at least somewhat divorced from your main character's driving motivations. And while fights with big scary monsters are cool in video games, they kind of feel hollow in anime, at least compared to conflicts with proper characters with their own motivations and ideologies. There just aren't enough white whistles to fill out a good roster of bosses. And while there are ways to give mindless monsters a bit more personality and narrative presence, Maiden Abyss can only get away with having Reg fight a monster, lose, then fight it again to show his growth as a character so many times before it gets old. In a video game, this just isn't a problem, because a fight against a dangerous monster with cool powers is inherently engaging when you're the one actually doing the fighting and figuring out its weaknesses. With all of this said, I don't think that Maiden Abyss is anything close to a bad anime. In fact, I'd say it's easily one of the top 10 of this year, but in my opinion, it would make a far better video game, and there's ample evidence that it was initially written to be one. I am hoping against hope that this anime, even as it rolls into its second season, isn't the end of the line for Maiden Abyss. I really hope that the success it's found with both Japanese and Western audiences is enough to earn it a video game adaptation of its own, because as engaging as it is to watch, I just can't help feeling that it would be a thousand times more fun to play. I'll turn it over to you, though. Do you guys see what I'm seeing here, or do you think I'm just suffering from Abyss Madness? And given the chance, would you rather experience Akihito Tsukushi's wonderful, terrible world as an anime or a game? Let me know in the comments below, and while you're at it, don't forget to hit subscribe and turn on notifications to see everything that Mother's Basement makes. And if you want to go out on an adventure of your own, uncovering cool, useful relics along the way, and eh, that's a bit of a stretch, but Loot Crate is still a fun way to get your hands on a surprise selection of cool collectibles at an affordable rate sent straight to your door every single month, or the door of someone you love, a subscription 
subscription to their Loot Anime Box, which you can save 10% on by going to lootcrate.com basement and using the promo code basement at checkout is a perfect Christmas gift for the weeb in your life, even if the weeb in your life is you. Every month brings with it a ton of great anime swag, including manga and light novel volumes, character goods, and figurines. And November's Gods and Spirits crate may well have been the best one they've released to date. The crate contained a set of Mushishi teacups, an exclusive hardcover mini art book collecting some of the best work of Yoshitaka Amino, the artist behind classic Final Fantasy, as well as Vampire Hunter D and the heroic legend of Arslan, and the piece de resistance, at least in my opinion, is this gorgeous Ban Presto prize figure of second best Jojo, Josuke Higashikata. Loot Crate has been consistently upping their anime game with each successive month, so I can't wait to see what's coming in their December Underdog Crate, which features goods from My Hero Academia, Batman and the Justice League, Saint Seiya, and... If you or someone you know is into any of those series, then now is the time to sign up for a Loot Anime subscription at LootCrate.com basement. That is, if now is between the release of this video and the cutoff date of December 27th. And even if those aren't your cup of tea, make sure to check out this month's other crates, which include stuff from Star Wars and Guardians of the Galaxy. Or if you want to support Mother's Basement more directly, head on over to patreon.com slash Mother's Basement to give me the gift that keeps on giving your money. If you do, you can have your name featured in Mother's Basement videos like all of these lovely individuals you're seeing right now. Or if you want to see me talk about game design elements in other animals, Anime, then check out this video where I break down the terrible design of SAO, or if Made in Abyss has put you in a fantasy mood, click here to hear me talk about the fantasy writing in the Ancient Magus Bride. And if this is the last I see of you today, then I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.